Well, hello, and thank you both for being here today uh, and taking some time. Uh, Jonathan and Tim, so great to be with you and, and speak to you about human aspects of the cybersecurity world and cybersecurity workforce. Um, and what a time to be speaking about cybersecurity, I must say. Um, it's been uh, quite a year or two um, with really unprecedented, I would say, focus at the federal level and across the board on cyber threats and uh, the U.S. public becoming uh, uh, interested in that. And I think we've really seen that, especially with these heightened tensions with Russia um, in the last few months. So I want to dive right in um, and ask you guys, you know, about what some of these heightened tensions um, in cyberspace, uh, especially from Russia, but also other nation states such as Iran and China, you know, how can we get our shields up as a country um, to, to quote, you know, CISA director Jen Easterly and other Biden officials, get our shields up, you know, in a way that not only protects our critical infrastructure, but also addresses um, some of the, the the failures in terms of our, our workforce and, and training the workforce uh, behind, behind these shields um, for either of you to start. You know, is there a heightened um, risk or is the threat landscape changed? It always is changing. I think one of the most important things, obviously, is that the companies move from what they're thinking of as just kind of a checkbox mentality, you know, compliance, which is kind of, I, I, I kind of describe that as paint by numbers, um, to more of original art, right? What we're doing is responding to human beings. And those human beings and those threat actors have, you know, they have names. They have reasons why they're coming after um, companies specifically. And sometimes it might just be their perception versus reality of what we have that they want to monetize or whatever. And then there's how they're doing it, right? The techniques. Uh, might, might or best said this or term this uh, threat informed defense. So how do you actually identify the threat actors? How do you, how do you answer these questions? Well, the only way it's really, really possible today is to, to, is to have uh, information sharing. And we've done a better job on that. Like if we're part of a, you know, ISACs, you know, for instance, um, then we get to share without, you know, in a, in a very, in a closed protected space, we can exchange information and we can look for these and then we can adjust based on that. Um, you know, we always are going to have, um, you know, instability that's going to cause other nation states to come after us. And we have more surface area today. So I think from, from what we ask, I think many of us is, you know, give us the right information, you know, let us know when there's changes. Uh, and if you do, then we can prepare and we can, we can better, be better at threat hunting. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, do you have any thoughts? That's a great point. I, yeah, of course, I always have thoughts. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a good point. I think, you know, when I think about information and what is, what is transformative information to improve a team's performance in any avenue of life, right? And I like to think about, I, I think it's useful, particularly when you're dealing with complex things like hexadecimal code, for example, which is not something that the public or in my old life, the foreign policy elite is sort of naturally grasps immediately. These are people who study history or read the news. And I think um, you, want to, you want to gear people towards data that they can understand. And that's true also for advanced teams. So consider a sports team, right? If a sports team, World Cup team, is preparing for a World Cup qualifying match and doesn't train against Messi, and the, the Argentine is, you know, hero of all time, and then they go up against him, like, he's going to school them. They're not going to be ready for him. And what the information that I think that makes a difference is information about the adversary. And for a long time, all that was classified. It was either classified or you had to be extremely rich. You had to be a very rich bank in order to have like multiple teams that could sort of study the adversary. And what MITRE ATT&CK has done is it's put it all out there for free as a periodic table that's growing and expanding with all source intelligence. So then we can, we can take that information and prepare our teams against the adversary. <laughs> I was just going to say that from the standpoint of um, preparing, like the defensive teams can't work in a silo. They need to understand what the offensive, let's say the, the adversary offensive, the offensive sides are actually doing and, and they're changing and they have the same issues that we have, like offensive teams, like nation states or criminal um, groups, they have the same problem we have. They have humans there that get into patterns of behavior. They have the same cognitive biases and we could benefit from that because if they're doing things that they're successful with, they will repeat those patterns. 
when those patterns change, right, it's more than likely because they brought people on who are thinking a little differently. And so we can start, we can start to evolve with them, but it does take, it does take um, sharing the very details about how the actual attacks work against other industries or within our own industry. And so at least we have, you know, if you're in critical infrastructure in somewhere, you need to be sharing information with the other groups specifically just so that we can be better at knowing when these patterns change. And uh, in terms of uh, kind of going off of your point of sharing information, um, one specific attack that, that really highlighted, I think, the need to look more at the cybersecurity workforce and, and looking um, at how to train them and specifically reduce the time to discover attacks was the solar winds attack, um, which was discovered at the end of 2020, but had been ongoing for some time before anyone noticed it. You know, and I, I guess I'll go to Jonathan first and then Tim, if you want to speak to this too. You know, what can we do to, to try to, you know, work towards uh, ensuring that this time is a little bit more shortened? You know, of course, solar winds was a very sophisticated attack, but what can we do in terms of the workforce to just make yeah. sure that the it doesn't go months and years before we see something like this? I, I, there's a couple of stories that I like to tell, and I'll try and tell them really briefly because I don't want people to fall asleep. But one one is like, um, there. Imagine imagine a customer um, who has a large security team, right? And there's a person who's responsible for signing off on a contract for a managed security service. And this person leaves their job for some reason, right? And because they leave, you haven't signed off on the multi-million dollar contract for the, for the incident response or the continuous monitoring contract from a managed security service. That means that security control is gonna be degraded. But if you, don't, if you aren't running continuous tests to exercise your teams going back to the sports analogy, you're not gonna know if and when that person has left their job. And more importantly, you're not going to be able to figure out why it is that they've left their job. So then you can be like, what is it that, you know, what is the reason? In this particular instance, they weren't getting paid enough. So it was a human resource problem. And the reason why I raise this is like, this is an orthogonal point to, to building on what Tim said earlier. It's an orthogonal point as, as people consider cybersecurity performance. You really have to think about people. And so there's the technology is the ultimate function. And what SolarWinds revealed, and I'm a big zero trust person, and from my past life is like, you could tell right off the bat that there weren't internal walls that were there to prevent the intruder from moving laterally. So what you actually wanna run in, in every, in, against the majority of Russian based hostile actors are lateral movement scenarios to say, because all the major cloud hacks, that there are many of the major ones, there's lateral movement at the center of it. They're moving across the data centers. So you need to be testing your teams against what we know and then say, are the technologies that are these super advanced, amazing technologies, are they performing as the best representation of the team's armaments? That's, that's the kind of answer that we want to get to. So I, I want to build on a couple of points there, but I want to answer the first one, which is, you know, I want to use solar winds, right? Remember, time to discover is not time to discover a vulnerability in a third party application, right? Mm -hmm. Time to discover is to discover someplace in the kill chain, right? The initial intrusion, you know, lateral movement, living off the land, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the gap with respect to solar winds is, is that we don't have the ability, you know, not every business out there can afford to dig into the minutia of every third party and the way that they manage their libraries and their build process and all of that. You want a suggestion there? Why didn't the government go off and have like a UL labs and do that kind of security pen testing and process testing for us and then give it a seal of approval? That aside, time to discover is about the misuse. So let's say a back door is opened. It's really what Jonathan was saying is what is the next step in, in the in the attack? Right. They're going to they're going to go from the central system there, use the credentials and then do something that should trigger a behavior change. And so it's really key when you look at, you know, how a program like what we're trying to build uh, matures, you know, eventually you're going to go to the to drive to the point of user and device behavior analytics. And that's where you create the biggest threshold for them to overcome. And then, you know, from the standpoint of um, human resources, uh, man, I'm, Jonathan and I are completely in agreement on that. Every piece of technology, I don't, I don't believe in AI. I mean, I've been working in AI for a long time, but, you know, knowledge-based systems, ML, powerful. Um, but I like to think of AI as augmented intelligence. 
And so I look at technology and I evaluate it based on its ability to overcome human limitation. I want to look a little bit as well at uh, the overall issue of workforce and how that feeds into our cybersecurity posture and talk about kind of how we think about, you know, keeping our shields up and, and cybersecurity being strong, but sometimes that boils down to simply the quality of life and uh, the what the cybersecurity workforce is offered. So, you know, can you speak to really, you know, what, what you're seeing in terms of, you know, steps that can be taken to, to keep cyber workers um, in, in certain jobs and to uh, enable a, a good spread of, of the cybersecurity workforce across different sectors um, for, for either of you who wants to take that first. Go ahead, Jonathan. I think, jump in. I think Tim should take it because he's got a, he's got a lot more <laughs> cyber workers working for him than I do. You know, you know, I, I think from the standpoint of you know engagement and you know you have to let you have to let your workforce individually find their passions and you have to coach them through that. Um, so I've structured you know a team that is built off of agile for security program improvement. But from the standpoint of what we do, um, I think what gets lost a lot of times is we bring the technology in. It takes a long time to implement it. And then, you know, you have to keep it up to date. So it's like, um, you know, keeping the lights on. And that's a lot of work, too. And so the, the question is, do we have the cybersecurity talent focused on the right objectives? Is the tooling actually taking us away from the real job? And for me, you know, it's about explaining it that cybersecurity professionals, my peers, uh, and they need to communicate this to all of the workforce is we have two responsibilities. One is to reduce the probability of a security breach or event. The other is to reduce the time to discover. And we've got to be balanced with respect to our investment and including allowing people to grow professionally under both sides. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much to be said for the, the sort of the meta point for this narrative, which I love, is that at, behind all these cyber attacks, there are human beings, right? Or behind all the defensive functions, there are human beings. So you have to start thinking about cybersecurity as the same field of leadership and human endeavor as every other one. And there's things like aligning your strengths to your tasks. And one of the things I've loved, and it's now been a long time that I've been working in this field, I've seen people, like extremely bright people in cybersecurity in the absolute wrong job and fail totally. Um, the, because they just weren't on the right job. There was an NSA engineer who was brilliant at doing all sorts of niche capabilities, who was one of the first people put on the first Department of Defense cyber strategy. And I was an English major, or I was a religion major and a creative writing major. And my boss was like, hello, we're writing the very first civilian policy on these issues. Can you please help this person? And that's how I learned about technology, right? But he was not in the right position. He then later went back to the National Security Agency and had a management role where he did incredibly well managing other engineers who were doing really niche builds or you know this one extremely talented person that i'm working with right now like i have the impression that he just loves to build new things and that's the attraction of startups but if you if you want to if you want to if you want to fight the bad guys there's really only one organization to go and work for in the united states that makes it legal and that's cyber commander of the national security agency or the fbi or the cia so i guess there's like a lot you have to join the federal government if you want to fight bad guys. You know. So real quick, um, I, I was just going to say that from the standpoint of how I described the two um, areas which you slot all of your work and investment, um, to Jonathan's point, you know, it's about humans, right? And so you've got to spend half your time focused on your own workforce, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, really trying to promote their careers, find their passions, get everybody working on the same playbook, get everybody thinking about security program improvement, and really pitching this, the narratives that we try to, to 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 get them to focus on the right things. The other side of the human equation, either you know my peers have to be doing it or they have to have a team dedicated to it, is understanding criminality, because the whole reason that the defense is here is because of the offense. And so you've got to figure out, has the offensive um, or the criminality or the criminal businesses or nation states, has it changed, right? Are there perception differences? Are there skill differences? Um, you know, is the market for certain dollars or information changing? Like all of this stuff needs to be understood so that we can do what I think we, in commercial companies in most places, cybersecurity has a unique role. Um, in that I believe that we're the only ones that are paid to make someone else's life miserable. Hmm. And 
we're paid to make the criminal's life miserable, not the employee's. And so you have to, to, to fulfill that, you have to understand who the adversaries are and drive up their cost, frustrate them, or send them off in the wrong direction. And, you know, I think I, I want to go back to a point, actually, that Jonathan just made about, you know, being able to work for the federal government and, and do these legal hacking operations. And, you know, for many uh, cyber professionals, that might be quite interesting, but that's certainly not the only um, avenue in cybersecurity that would probably pique someone's interest. Um, for both of you, you know, do you think that there's enough messaging done to really try to recruit people into the cyber workforce uh, by using simply the message of, of the extremely... Uh, cool uh, things that they get to do in these jobs, and not just for the federal government, but for the private sector as well. Jonathan, if you want to go first. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, um, in recent events, which are deeply troubling over the last few months, um, the adversary has accelerated a lot of changes in national security overall and in cybersecurity in particular. Historians may argue, like, what was it that led to the passage of recent bills, for example? But I would argue, in, in a way, as the threat has sharpened, I mean, I get text messages from aunts and uncles and people all over the world about my work when something happens. Oftentimes, it's not something that I'm working on at all. And so the, it, it, it's actually, it's made it easier, I think, for, for people to enter the workforce, to, to be attracted to the field as something interesting. And I've, I've, seen, I've seen the workforce change. I like to point out, like, as a historian, um, I've now seen three, I've now known three directors of the NSA and Cyber Command, and the, even those those three have changed. Paul Nakasone, I knew when he was a colonel, and he's grown up. Or Ann Neuberger, I knew her when she was running the Defense Industrial Base pilot in 2010, and now she's the White House National Security Advisor for Cyber. So you've seen these people who were in their early 30s, younger, from you know, diverse backgrounds, rising up through the chain that have matured. Um, and so, you know, it's catalytic events like Stuxnet in 2010. That changed the world. It made the front page of The Economist or, or wherever it was, New York Times, tons of reporting about it. People, it really changed how people think about geopolitics. And so that, that's, that make, that's an interesting problem set. And, and Tim has talked about, like, there's so many different things to do in the field that makes it really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'll have to say, you know, I, I, I struggled early on with, hiring folks you know when most of us when we started there was only one place you came from and that was military or government mm -hmm. um and then mm -hmm. you know get the financial services sector you know it changed from you know physical bank robberies into you know cyber crime and so there there was investment there and that was the only other place that we could go so when i started interviewing folks i was like okay well tell me how you got into security i was looking for first i'd ask them questions about like things that they're passionate about outside of that. And I wanted to see if their facial expressions, you know, matched with cybersecurity questions, you know, so I knew that it was a passion of theirs. Uh, some of the best hires that I've made were um, geologists or, you know, just areas that you wouldn't think, but they have the cognitive ability. And, you know, when they were little girls or little boys, more than likely, they like to take things apart versus put them together. <laughs> I'm not saying there's not a yeah. role for both, but but there is certain characteristics that makes you good at this, or at least predisposes you to be good at, good at this. The one area where I think actually there's, Tim's talking about a, a cultural change in the diversification of, of the field away from the national security community, but Oren Falkowitz, who founded Area One, which was recently acquired, um, Area One Security, uh, there, oh, yes, I think it's Area One. I might have the name wrong. Um, he, he said to me once a few years ago, cybersecurity is national security. And I was like, well, that's an interesting thing. If you're in the private sector, you're actually a member in a way of the national security community. You may not have a top secret clearance, but you are. And when I began to look at the fun, like programmatic failures against known tactics like lateral movement, I was so irritated when solar winds happened because I knew, having worked at Illumio previously, that that technology could have stopped it. It was so irritating. It's like, this is the huge gap that I've been advocating for for years. And what I actually want to see is a, is a cultural shift in the civilians who've entered into cybersecurity to say, okay, you know, yes, the threat is real. We get it. And adversaries will do th everything from disinformation operations to attack and colonial pipeline. We need to be as ready for what the adversary could do to us. We need to train as much as the military does, even though we're civilians. Like we may be living... In, you know, and living a very different kind of life than people in the military. But you have to train 
and prepare in the same way for what the adversary is going to do. Oh my gosh. Can I jump on that for a second? It's like, I know that we all, we all have unique backgrounds and I know that I benefit from my time being in the military and working at DISA, you know, and it's, and the things that I think about today, I have an obligation to kind of bring to the discussion where a lot, they're just not getting it. Like, like Jonathan said a word that is a, it's a big thing for me. I just, I love it. And it's disinformation, right? So OPSEC is something you were trained on in the military. You understood it. It was real. And understanding, you know, I don't know how many people, how many of my peers read, you know, the Purple Dragon, you know, and what happened during Vietnam that started a lot of this. But, but using deception is a key or a fundamental key to actually frustrating is to making the criminal's job more difficult. And it's, it's just not something that's brought up as often. You see a little bit more of it now, but, but uh, it's not enough. So that's just one example of things that we used that just aren't conveyed or brought into um, you know, the commercial or private sector. Yeah, that's a great point. I actually wanted to see, Jonathan, if you had any thoughts, you know, following up on that, on if there's, you know, enough focus put on, you know, training the cyber workforce to recognize disinformation and the misinformation um, in, in that space, because it is an issue that, that really affects all sectors. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, th there's been a bit of a confluence in recent years as the Russian government's activities, I would argue, in in heading into the, 20, the 2016 election, the disinformation activities that the Russian government conducted were a catalytic and transformative event for the technology sector overall to look at the platforms that were being built. And in some cases, this is a difference of culture. Like, I'm not saying that people in California all believe in utopias, but certainly there are people in California who have utopic visions of the world. And that, that was the promise of the internet in the 1990s. It was going to connect everyone and, and build and build so much wonder. And it did, it gave us the likes of eBay and e-commerce and email, and you could, you know, you could write your grandmother and then all, then there was Skype and the whole thing was amazing. Um, it still is amazing. Right. But it's also got this dark underbelly and that was revealed to us profoundly through, you know, and, and we're, we're, we will have published by this point, a, a, some, a new attack graph about Havex malware. Havex is an old school black energy malware that came out in 2015, 2016. When I was working on Black Energy the first time in 2015, the Russian government was planning disinformation operations through social media, which I will confess freely, I was not thinking about because I was super focused on the hard work of cybersecurity, like the hard malware-based, defense-based work of cybersecurity. But what happened after that interference was there was a confluence between these two communities, which had a lot to offer. And I think there's been a, a real deepening and an enrichment um, and some cyberspace operations have been conducted to blunt and disrupt disinformation operations because the U.S. Cyber Command is prepared to defend the nation against cyber attacks of abroad, which means they can access command and control systems abroad and warn adversaries say you need to stop or else we're going to do something. And this is this is a broader question, uh, more amongst uh, along the lines of public private partnership. Um, I know last month in March, uh, CISA really uh, leaned forward in terms of transparency with the public by publishing the three hour recording of a call that CISA held with 13,000 uh, private sector uh, groups uh, talking about the risk to, to critical infrastructure. Do you think that the federal government um, has learned quite a bit from some of the challenges in recent years in terms of these major cyber attacks and and that there has been improvement um, in terms of coordination with the private sector where so many of these threats are seen. Um, you know, Tim, do you want to take that first? <laughs> it's not where it needs to be. Um, you know, at this point, it's a, it's a little bit one way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of the stuff about, um, you know, specifically about providing information on, you know, incidents and things like that. Great. But it is a one way street. Uh, there's very little, at least that's original and actionable coming towards us. We really need to rely on ourselves. Um, but that's not to say across all, I mean, their criminality is a business, right? There's a good set of these threat actors who are just working in a business. They have marketing people, they have tech support, they have, you know, all of that. And that infrastructure is one that we need to know. If you are in a business, which actually has to also worry about the probability of, you know, nation states, you know, wanting something, you know, that's where, that's where, um, you know, we need a little bit of information ahead of time and some detailed stuff. Um, 
And I would say probably the other part when you're talking about contribution, you know, from the government, um, they have the power of, you know, creating that UL labs like approval of that complex uh, evaluation of third parties and the way that they produce code and all of this. If they really wanted to um, to make a movement there and helping us, they could do something like that. Third party, third party oversight, third party, um, you know. Uh, risk analysis for us is, is extremely complicated and expensive. Jonathan, do you have that's, any thoughts um, on this? That's cool. Yeah, of course I do. And I love that you started with Tim because his view matters more because I'm obviously like after seven years in, in the federal government, I'm, I have fought so hard to get rid of these biases for defending the government, but the patriot in me can't ever stop. Um, you know, I think, I think one thing that is interesting to point out is the Lockheed Martin kill chain was originally classified and it is what led to the MITRE attack matrix. So what does the government do that's interesting in this space? And this is a massive step back that I was not ever planning on talking about in this session on human performance factors, but the government funds basic research, right? It funds laboratories that, and these are, it has resources to apply to long-term problems. And one of those resources is the, is the MITRE Corporation, which is a federally funded research and development corporation. But there's a litany of others. The RAND Corporation is another one. The Center for Naval Analysis. These are populated by some of the smartest people in the United States, period, bar none. Christine Fox being one of them. She uh, is known to many of you as having been portrayed by, um, oh gosh, it's either Kelly McGillis or Elizabeth Shue in uh, Top Gun. But that was the character she was based on. She was a naval an analyst. And you can do this sort of long burn research that produces something like the MITRE attack framework, which then can transform how we think about adversaries. And another one that I would say is the government also does things that it, it can scale propositions at, in a way that the private sector can't to enable certain kinds of solutions. So for example, we can, the, gov the federal government can procure all sorts of different services from cybersecurity providers to see which one works and then it can, it can share information back. Now, um, you were asking really about public-private partnerships, and, and I think there's a combined operational function that I've seen mature, um, and I'd be curious uh, what Tim would hope to see. Like, what, Tim, what would be, the, what would be, the, what would be the, the world you'd like to see from a public-private cooperative standpoint where you would say that the sectors across the country were benefiting, whether the airline sector or otherwise? Yeah, I mean, it's really about providing information on things that we need to take into account from a threat, uh, from a um, threat informed defense perspective. So, you know, the threat actor groups changing, especially the ones that are actually are targeting the government. Um, you know, our threat landscape on the commercial side is actually more complex than the government. When the government, you know, you have a very specific asset, you know, you have a lot of, um, you have a narrower focus on who's coming after you and what you have to offer in a company. It's varied, you know, it depends. It could be, it could just be monetization of card. It could be, you know, getting um, initial compromise so that you can hand it off to a ransomware group. It could be, you know, a nation state wanting passenger data, you know, whatever it is, it's, it is, um, you know, it is on the burden of the government to share things that they know in um, in a realm where it doesn't take a lot of hoops to get access to it. Not everything is TS. I, I worked in the government, you know, it, it needs to be declassified and given to, um, you know, the information sharing groups like FSI SAC, AI SAC, you know, so forth and so on, so that we can all benefit from it. Um, and that we're working as a collective defense uh, against it. That's one thing I do want to go back to what Jonathan said, and maybe things have gotten better, but, you know, we're talking in 1990s, I was working on the first uh, intrusion prevention system, active defense in the world, and it was in the government, and it was placed on a shelf, and it never made, it never got commercialized. I think there's a disconnect between the investment that's made there and getting something into the marketplace for us to actually use. And, yep. and I, yes, I have benefited from DARPA's research and investment, definitely have. Yeah, I mean, this this is a, this is we should have a whole other session about the nexus of, of like long term basic research that then spins out into into the private sector. Um, one one area that I do want to flag on the basic recent reporting, which I've which I've talked about publicly a little bit with folks that have been closer to it than I have, um, is in advance of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was a marked 
increase in cooperation between the federal government and say Microsoft, which is our, which has done a really good job of working to further the conversation in cybersecurity and the practice of cybersecurity as a global technology company. And Brad Smith came out with a statement. He said something to the effect of, we may be a multinational company, but we are not neutral and we're going to prepare for what we know is coming. And what, what I've heard from folks in the government is that there were all sorts of clearances that were, that were given out very quickly to help people learn about what the threat actor was doing and to then prepare for it. And that to me is, this is like a long burn process of saying, We've needed to bring people together closer. And so it is, again, it's threat focused. You're focusing on the adversary that is at the door, quite literally, and mm -hmm. saying, what can we bring together? And this make, this forces leaders to make decisions that they may be uncomfortable making. They may have thought sort of, I'm going to punt this decision further down the line in, in a pre-war scenario. But when you enter into a war scenario, those decisions can be made in a heartbeat. As we saw private companies leave Russia overnight, um, the ones that, that remained really had, had to explain themselves quite a bit. And so there, there were a lot of decisions that were made very quickly by, by corporations that were dealing with this war. And one of the areas is in cybersecurity. You know, I, I would say one thing that we have to be cognizant of today, and it's only getting, it's only getting worse, is, um, is speed. You know, the U.S. government and many governments are not known for um, uh, being quick to release information or... Um, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy there. And just taking, taking a look at like something like Kaseya breach, right? Um, you know, they discovered a weakness. Um, they did an inventory and within a couple hours executed, you know, that's, that's the kind of rapid stuff we're dealing with. And as we get closer into actually the fruition of, you know, ML being applied on the offensive side, you know, it's like all of a sudden we have to be defending that quickly. And, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things that, you know, I would just advocate for maybe a little more speed and a little less bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, this is certainly, I think from, from a human performance function, um, trying to strip away that bureaucracy has meant building bonds between people who are like-minded, who are willing to get things done. And I've, I've yeah. seen a real deepening in the space uh, in recent memory. I'll go with your optimism. <laughs> I'm and, there with you. <laughs> but to kind of put this back a little bit more in the human centric area, uh, Jonathan, of course, you mentioned Microsoft and Microsoft put out um, mm -hmm. a report highlighting Women's History Month last month, uh, noting that there were over 2.5 million unfilled mm -hmm. cybersecurity jobs and pressing for more diversity uh, in, in gender uh, equality in the space of cybersecurity jobs. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll start with uh, with you, Tim, because I know that you, you've you been working to diversify, I think, the workforce. Um, can you speak to, you know, the areas that need improvement in terms of diversity in the cyber workforce and, you know, steps that can be taken uh, to, to accomplish that goal? Yeah, I mean, the biggest challenge has been, you know, on, um, you know, gender diversity. And I think part of it came originally, obviously, military government, you know, just the, the machine that was used for conveying, you know, raw talent into the field just wasn't there. And even in, you know, it's just, it's not cultivated as an, as a, um, as a, an exciting profession to be in, but it really is. And so I've spent my time actually trying to figure out how to create those conveyors. And, you know, the reason that it's exciting is because it is a human problem, right? It's a, it's an adversary problem. It's an internal management and skills and passions. You got to find all of that. So, you know, for me, I spend most of my time thinking about psychology or cognitive biases and, and, you know, you can pull talent, especially uh, gender diverse talent from multiple departments, you know, inside academia and other places. So it's, uh, you know, the best thing to do is to advocate, I've seen is just to advocate with some of the women's leadership forums, um, even outside of cybersecurity and try to pull people in who have, you know, a real interest in it or and cognitive ability. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, any thoughts? I know you do. No, I've got, I've got so many thoughts, Maggie, you know, um, I, I've, I, I threaten now at this point to be telling so many stories of back when I was, you know, young, cause I've been in doing cybersecurity for 12 years. But when we first started the cyber policy office in the Pentagon, it was entirely made up of detailees. Um, some of whom had emerged from backwaters, some of whom, you know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a little bit like these sort of Western movies where it's like you, 
you build an office of the people you can, like who's volunteering, raise your hand and a bunch of people step back. Um, but within like a very short period of time, within a very short period of time, as, as we had better leaders that came in into the Pentagon, you began to see this loud rushing sound of talent run towards the office. And there was this great deputy assistant secretary named Eric Rosenbach, who had more charisma in his finger than like most people have in their entire bodies. And the way he would communicate about the risks and the opportunities that were in this office, it was like flooding. You just heard this great sound of people fleeing offices, like leaving the Afghan desk. And um, with people like Kate Charlotte, who's just tremendously talented, or Lisa Wiswell, who was a, previously at DARPA, he was attracting these talents. And then the inch, like, you know, once I left government and had time to read magazines like Wired or New York Times, the number of, of women who I began to see in cybersecurity who were doing some of the coolest things in the world. And I began to recognize that these were, these were people in my peer group or younger. And that gave me like to get back on my optimistic horse, like so much hope for the future of gender and racial diversity in this field, because it is super fascinating. And, you know, I've, I've worked very hard to try and attract people from different fields to come, to come work for me, work for attack IQ, work in cyber policy, because the world is made better when you have a diversity of viewpoints. And that's like, that's the way it is. Um, so I'm, I'm super, super bullish about, about that. Yeah, I would say one other thing with respect to, um, you know, the DEI, you know, I don't like to forget uh, inclusion. And the thing is, is that one of the biggest challenges that I've seen is not just in gender diversity, but it is, we all have a different uh, makeup with respect to our psychology, right? And some of us may be, you know, just slightly introverts or extreme extroverts, you know, there's, there's all characteristics associated with that. I'm an auditory learner, others are visual, right? And so you have to figure out how to adapt your workforce to that, even meetings. Like I, I, I haven't proven this out, but I think a lot of times when I see people who don't interact during meetings, don't provide feedback, right? They might, they might be a little bit more towards the introvert side. And I'm thinking that if we give an agenda ahead of time and let them think about it, you know, it's not that they're slower. It's just that they're processing that plus what everybody else is thinking and, and all of that. So there's a way to, um, you know, adapt your workforce, your work style to include all of those people um, and make them, you know, give them a, a, a fair seat at the table. Yeah, and and I know that that maybe you you may disagree, but to take back to the the number of uh, two point five million um, unfilled cybersecurity positions, I know that there's been wide um, discussion about the the need to focus on on cybersecurity, not just looking at the diversity and broadening the field, but simply looking at the fact that there are a lot of open positions, at least according to to several reports that are out. Um, you know, what what more can be done to help fill these gaps? Um, you know, are, are are you guys concerned that this is gonna uh, impact our, our nation's ability to, to resist both cyber criminals, nation states, any threat actors um, for, for either of you to start? I mean, it's, it's a very, I'll start, it's a very interesting question because if you were to say, like, if you were to run a consulting business, you have a matrix department and resource planning and all of that. If I was to take every uh, commercial enterprise in the United States and was able to sort people based on a matrixed approach, right, mm -hmm. I would probably move workforce, you know, in different concentrations to different companies, depending on, you know, the risk profile or consequences associated with it. And I think what you're seeing is people who just maybe the, the workforce that's out there may not be distributed in the most efficient way. Uh, so I think part of it is, um, you know, a little bit maybe overspending on some accounts, underspending on others, but there is a need for people to come into it, and especially those that have a passion for this area. So, you know, I, I think, Maggie, I, I um, if I ever masquerade as a labor statistician, like the world is in very rough shape. So caveat my comments at that. But um I, I think that there's a lot of room to work smarter in cybersecurity and that I, I gauge that by, in, by the level of knowledge that I have around certain things and how the same mistakes keep happening over and over. And that is not because we don't have enough people. It's because the people aren't focused on the right things. And so we, we have statistics, uh, that somewhere around, you can only trust somewhere between 30 to 40, maximum 50% of your security controls at any given time. And that's after a decade of massive innovation and massive investment with the emergence of companies like CrowdStrike. 
companies like Illumio that are providing foundational and tons of others that we work with. Who I, sh I, should, I should never name only two because then all the other children feel left out. But like there's amazing growth in, in, in the workforce. And actually what needs to happen is we need to prepare for the adversary. We need to prepare for what we know they're going to do. And like, sure, if you, if you throw 10,000 people at me, I can build something, If you know, and like Tim probably has that many people that work for him. But like, what, I, what are they building? What are they getting ready for? I want you to go from 30 to 40 to 50 to 70. I want you to be able to report a year after solar winds. where you have now invested in a zero trust strategy where you launched an, exe an executive order saying we're, we're launching zero trust after after solar winds. Those people should be called up in front of Congress. Some of them are my friends. I'm sorry. They should be called up in front of Congress and Congress people should say, OK, you, you're, you call for this. How is your performance now? And I, the only question I have is, how are you performing against lateral movement? Because that's what they're doing. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, no, I, it's well, first off, I, I, uh, this is a whole nother session. I don't believe in zero trust. I believe it's a um, it's a it's it's not a good term. But that aside, set that, set that aside, I do believe in what it was based on, which is least privilege. Right. And the concepts that have been around a long time, those principles exist. They might just have a new marketing term or a spin. But, but the, from the standpoint of like, um, you know, the, the human involvement, um, we have, you, you said practice, and I want to key in on that. And that is that if we take all of this workforce that we currently have, right, and we focus them on implementing technology and then keeping the lights on, you know, and, and updating it, you know, they're only doing half the equation. The other half is really what the tools are supposed to do is to reduce time to discover. And so you've got to have equal investment of labor and capital on both sides. And that part of um, that, that other side of reducing time to discover means things like threat hunting, identifying the actors. And when you do that, then you get an opportunity to actually run simulations and test and then prove where you're at from a maturity standpoint, prove what investment you think is going to move the needle, and then even demonstrate that to boards. So I think it's I think it's you know getting into the human factor side. It's not about the it's not about the uh, implementing the tools and the technology. It's about really training the workforce to to focus on reducing time to discover, which then reduces consequence. Yep. Yeah. And there's a great story on this, um, which you both have heard me say, which is like there um, a, a customer had hired a managed security service provider and was paying them millions of dollars to do monitoring and incident response, millions and millions of dollars. And they had just started continuous testing and automated testing. The automation part is super important. Um, and the, the MSSP said, we'll respond in a matter of hours from time of detection. We'll do an incident response, you know, hours after detection. And they ran the test, the alert went off and they called six days, six days later which means you can now turn and have that conversation with the MSSP that's like, hey, do you remember that check that I wrote for you for a million dollars when you said that you would call in a few hours? In a few hours? Well, it's Thursday. So now, you know, we can go back and let's have a, let's have a difficult conversation about how you're going to improve. And that's the kind of thing that, like, we want outcomes. We've had enough spending and, and, and like, speeds and feeds that blow our minds. We want outcomes, like real business and security outcomes. You know, that's a, that's a key point. You know, it's about it's about getting reasonable SLAs in there, right? And the way that you achieve it is not by them saying that everything that they have to detect and notice, you know, it's like, it has to be very specific things. Like everybody's only good at looking at for, a, a, you know, a, a certain number of, of um, alerts or triggers or events. So you've got to structure your program such that you are taking advantage of things like tripwire or, or deception for the point of making it easier to find anomalies in behavior, anomalies in devices. These are techniques that need to be deployed, but they're being, they're just not being addressed because they're not in some framework someplace. Well, um, thank you. I, it looks like we've uh, kind of hit our, our time for this session, although uh, I feel like I could I could talk to you both for, for much longer about uh, this overall topic. Um, thank you both for taking the time to, to speak today. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing area of interest that I think this conversation will just continue. So uh, thank you both.